not allowed to say Happy New Year anymore. Do you agree with that? What's your, uh, whatever you call it, moratorium or deadline for Happy New Year? <laughs> I don't have a moratorium, Scott. You can say Happy New Year. Happy New Year to all you guys. I don't know which ones are grumpy about saying that, but, you know, I imagine. I'll give you one guess. Day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to see you in, like, July, and I'll be like, hey, Ken, Happy New Year. You can say it whenever you want, AJ. I'll be good. <laughs> uh Ken, let's let's start with I mean you, you've written a lot over the past week. I want to go to what you wrote about Josh Hader and his comparison to Edwin Diaz. I'm sure that's a contract that he's looking at this offseason and there's deferrals mixed in that I didn't even realize or remember from Edwin Diaz. So, what do you think about his market and what the money could look like? You know, Scott, I didn't remember that the Diaz deal had deferrals either. And basically, it's $26.5 million of the $102 million that is deferred, lowers the present day value to something like $93 million. So the point I was making when I wrote about that was that really, Josh Hader doesn't have to beat $102 million to say I'm the biggest reliever contract in history. He can beat 93 and say, present day value, I got it. Now, I imagine that still is what he's looking at, whether it's 93 whether it's 102 if you're Josh Hader, you can certainly make a case that you have been a better reliever than Edwin Diaz, and you're competing in an open market for a contract, whereas Diaz, it was right before free agency, so he was still only talking with the Mets. Now, remember, Diaz was coming off an amazing year, second all-time strikeouts per nine in that 2021 season. He had the trumpets blaring, he had a captive owner, and it just seemed like the time was right for him. And... GMs will tell you from time to time that just because one reliever or one pitcher or one player signs what they determine to be an outlier contract, it doesn't mean that that should be the comp for others. And that's probably the rationale that Hader is hearing. But if he's Josh Hader, he's thinking, hey, I'm the best, man, and I need the best contract. And that probably is why he is not signed right now. Obviously, that's why he's not signed. That is why all of the players who are unsigned are still out there. They've not gotten the deals that they want. Now, let me ask you this on the hater front. Do you know of teams that are waiting in the wings to sign him, but are they kind of reeling back because of the money? Or do they think he doesn't deserve that? Like, what, what do you think is going on with all that rationale right there? Because he is a superior reliever, and he's been doing it for a lot of years now, and a lefty who throws really hard, has some unhittable pitches. But what is the case right now? Because we're getting closer and closer to spring training. There's a lot of free agents that haven't signed, especially a guy like Josh Hader, who any team can use right now. Todd, generally speaking, it's always a financial question, right? The teams interested do not want to pay what Josh Hader wants. If there was a team interested that wanted to pay what Josh Hader wants, Josh Hader would be signed by now. So that is the overall view. Now, if you want to ask me which teams are in on this, I actually am not sure because there has not been a lot of information coming out about Hader. Certainly there are teams you can look at and match with him. Texas might be one of them, for instance. And yet Texas is caught up in this regional sports network situation where they're not quite clear on what they have to spend yet. And if they do get let's say, the approval from ownership to spend on one big player, which I imagine it would be one, not multiples, it probably would be Jordan Montgomery. That's one example. I am sure there are other teams waiting and seeing if Josh Hader will fall to a price that is more comfortable for them, a distressed price, so to speak. Now, I don't know why Josh Hader would fall and be a distressed asset in any stretch of the imagination. He's coming off a really good year. I know his walk rate was up a little bit, but he's still Josh Hader. But I'm sure there are teams that are doing the equivalent of bottom feeding and trying to think that maybe Josh Hader will fall to them. We'll see if that happens. I don't expect it to. Of the main guys left, you know, your Cody Bellinger, your Snell, your Hader, Montgomery, who has the most suitors in the sense of, like, if, if Hader only has – you know, three teams and Chapman has five teams. Who would you say, in your opinion, has the most suitors going after them currently? Eric, that's a great question. And it would only be a guess on my part, but I would guess it's Montgomery. And the reason I say that is because Snell at the top of the market, the two-time Cy Young winner, is a guy that 
has the high walk rate, has the lack of innings, kind of has these questions around him. Is he the guy we saw in 18 and 23, or is he the guy we saw from 19 to 22? He's a really good pitcher. We all know that. And he is capable of fronting a rotation. But Montgomery, teams would imagine or know, is not going to cost as much as Snell. He is quite accomplished in his own right, though not at Blake Snell's level. And he's coming off a great postseason. So I would think that maybe he has the most of that group. Bellinger and Chapman, as I said on fair territory this week, along with Snell, all of those guys have questions surrounding them. And they're all good players. Don't get me wrong. They're all guys who are going to get well-paid and should get well-paid in an open market setting. But it's not like Shohei Otani, right, who had some questions too, but is this transcendent talent. These guys are players with some warts, and that is probably what is holding them back. Montgomery, it seems to me, of the Boris big four remaining, has the fewest warts in a sense. It might be the fewest or the lowest upside too, but it would be my guess that he's the one getting the most interest from in terms of a multiple team kind of situation. Ken, I'll mix in a fan question here, and there's just a lot of chatter in general right now, and I think some of this plays off the Dodgers pulling off the biggest signing of the week again in Teoscar Hernandez. So Joe says, hey, Ken, what do you think? Should there be a salary cap in the future and why? And there's a lot of chatter. I'll just give one example. Cliff goes, is there a profit cap for MLB? Then no salary cap for players. It's been a big topic all off season long. People thinking that the Dodgers are on another planet who forget that they didn't do anything last off season. But what's been your response when you see this? And I'm sure there's been tons of comments in the athletic uh, bottom section there after the articles. Oh, I've gotten tons of comments. Yes. And after I wrote following the Otani signing that this was good for baseball, that the Dodgers are one of the premier franchises and for them to have Otani actually is a good thing and it doesn't necessarily disrupt parity because we have an expanded playoff system and we have a team, the Dodgers, that for all of their might over the last 10 or so years has only won one World Series and in a COVID-shortened campaign. That said, fans reacted to that rather negatively and a lot of fans think this is a sport that has lost its way. It's a sport that is too imbalanced and I would just suggest looking at the World Series results from the past, I don't know, 20 years. And you would see that there haven't been many repeat winners, if at all, right? We haven't had a repeat champion since the 1998 to 2000 Yankees. So, yes, it is easier for teams that spend money to get to the playoffs. It probably is easier for them to sustain success. And low-revenue executives would tell you, executives from low-revenue teams, that the model is broken, that they can't keep up, and that the disparity is only getting wider. I don't know that a cap is the answer to that. In fact, I would say that the cap is not an answer to that because, one, the union is never going to go for it. This is the one union that has not caved on a salary cap among the professional sports leagues unions. And the other thing I would say is that baseball can do things structurally to enhance competitive balance beyond where it is now beyond the things that are in place now, beyond revenue sharing, beyond draft pick compensation. You can get the low revenue teams more draft picks. You can do other things that would help them without needing a cap. And I would also say, if you look at the other sports, everybody says, oh, the NFL is great because it has a cap. The NFL's parity is not so great. Now, granted, Pat Mahomes can stay in Kansas City. Josh Allen can stay in Buffalo, and that's a great thing. And that in baseball doesn't really happen long term. But to say that there is more parity in that sport than there is in baseball, I would suggest that is not the case, and you can look it up. Ken, two weeks from now, I think the 23rd, right, is when the Hall of Fame is announced. Is that correct? So you got yes. two weeks, and you just released your ballot recently, and you voted for 10 guys. Can we, can we show your, your ballot on there? You can show it, but it was nine, AJ, not 10. Nine, sorry. I, I couldn't see my toes. There it is. Um, and can, also can, on fair territory, you can hear more. But yeah, what do you got? We, we can't see it because of the scroll. I just wanted <laughs> to, to talk about Ken's signature on the bottom down there. <laughs> That's what you wanted? Yeah, I don't care about who he voted for. But his signature is unbelievable. It's like a fourth grader's signature. AJ, and, and, and that then is his, not and then inaccurate. He, you know what the problem is, Ken? You've written in shorthand your whole life. 
So then when it comes to actually write your name in print, you're still writing it in shorthand. Well, my handwriting is a subject of great humor in my household. And at least one of my three children, one who will remain nameless, has equally bad handwriting. And we can't figure out how that happened. Probably hereditary. <laughs> Not something I'm proud of. But yes, if you looked at my Hall of Fame ballot, AJ actually wasn't the only one to comment on this. I got a text message from a fellow writer who said, yeah, my handwriting is elementary school level as well. So this is why I type for a little not write handwritten notes. Oh, I like that. Let's normalize bad handwriting. Dude, it's, but if he's short <laughs> we need to normalize it, Scott. When you work with, when you work with Kenny, shorthands in his yeah, little, he carries seen. his notebook around. Yeah. And it's like, I'm like, dude, you're drawing doodles in that thing? What is that? <laughs> and he's like, no, I can read. I'm like, what? That doesn't even make sense. It's his just, own language. No one else can that's steal true. the no notebook and see it. what he says it's in like there. It's like the enigma in World War II. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then, I mean, we might as well, while we're there, uh, you posted that. You spoke about it on Fair Territory. My question is, where have you received the most positive or negative feedback on what you put out there? And I guess I'll just add to this, too. We had Gary Sheffield on for a long time the other day, and he was really laying out what went on during his time period of, of the you know, PED accusations. So I don't know if you, if you saw any of that or if that helped influence you, um, not just that, but what you've seen in the past from what he said. Scott, you're assuming I've been looking at the feedback and kind of with the Hall of Fame, <laughs> I try to stay away from it, but I have voted for Chef pretty consistently over the last several years. So nothing he said had anything to do with that. Although I did enjoy his interview with you guys, I vote for him because he had 509 home runs because the PED accusation is flimsy because we have other PED users in the Hall of Fame. And while he was not a great defender by any stretch of the imagination, the bat waggle, the home runs, the fear he inspired in other pitchers, that is what does it for me. He is a Hall of Famer for those reasons. I would imagine on my ballot the most feedback or the most – people upset would be with Rollins and Utley and Rollins in particular. And I explained in the column that I wrote about my ballot, why I voted for those two. And it kind of goes back to Trammell and Whitaker, who are two guys that had very similar careers for the Detroit Tigers, the middle infielders. One of them didn't get in on the writer's ballot for 15 years and then got in on the veterans committee. And the other dropped off the writer's ballot the first year he was eligible. That's Lou Whitaker. And I always felt it was wrong, or I felt since Trammell's election, that it's wrong that Trammell's in and Whitaker's not. So I look at Utley and Rollins, and they're quite different candidates. And also, they are not as similar statistically as Trammell and Whitaker were. And you can make the case that Rollins' career OPS plus, it's 5% below league average, not good enough. But the way I see him, he's the all-time Phillies hits leader. He's a guy who was part of really good teams for five or six years, a team that went to the World Series twice, won it once, kind of the perfect complement to Chase Utley. He's a guy with counting numbers. Chase Utley is a different kind of Hall of Fame candidate. He is a guy with a great short peak. Chase Utley, to me, is almost a quintessential Hall of Famer, not simply because of the numbers, and I know he has fewer than 2,000 hits, but because of the cultures he helped create where he went, Philadelphia and the Los Angeles Dodgers. Those players who were with those teams, the executives, the coaches, the managers, they revered Utley, and they revered him because of the impact he made, not just with his performance, but behind the scenes, off the field. And I just felt, ultimately, if I was going to vote for Utley, and Rollins, while borderline, was certainly a guy you would not say would lower the hall, then I wanted to vote for both. And that's why I did it. Now, I understand that people will disagree with both of those choices, if not one. And I understand why. The Hall of Fame is a very personal decision when you make that vote, that choice. And each of us, men and women who vote, have different approaches to it. It's kind of the beauty of it. And it's a large enough voting body, 400 plus, that we generally, but not always, generally get it right. So that's my logic, that's my explanation. And one other thing I should mention also, unrelated to that, People ask all the time, well, if you voted for Bonds and Clemens, which I did, how come you do not vote for A-Rod and Manny? A-Rod and Manny were players who were suspended after the penalties were in place, after the rules were established. And in my mind, that 
disqualifies them, at least for now. I revisit this every year, and there's always a possibility I change my mind, but it's really difficult for me to vote for those guys when they knew the rules, they knew the penalties, and they still did it. I love that part about Jimmy and Jimmy and Chase, like just teammates that just came to play every single day. I, I think you nailed it on the head there. But if you had your nine picks and they said, Ken, you only get one because these – these nine are not all going to make it. Who is the one that you're like, I really hope this is the year that he makes it. I would wash all my other picks off for this one guy. Well, it's Sheffield's last year, so that would maybe influence me. But to me, the most obvious Hall of Famer on this list is Beltre. The hit total, the home run total, the gold gloves at third base, the character and the leadership he brought to his teams – he is a guy that if I had to vote for one player this year, that would be the one I would vote for. And I would agree with you on that 100%. <clears throat> Changing gears here, fan question from Robert in the chat. Why have the White Sox, why are they stalling the trade cease instead of getting multiple position prospects from Baltimore? I don't believe they're stalling. I believe they're waiting for the best possible deal. And Baltimore is certainly a team with the prospects to get this done, with the ability to satisfy the White Sox. But what the White Sox see is a market that is starved for starting pitching and has only a number of quality pitchers still available. I'm talking about Imanaga, who is going to make his decision within two days because his deadline is Thursday. Snell and Montgomery, Marcus Stroman, if you want to throw him in. But there are more teams with more starting spots available than exist in the market there are more there's greater demand than there is supply that's what i'm trying to say here so when you have that situation you're the white Sox. you're thinking as they've thought from the beginning that toward the end after these guys go off the board there are going to be teams on tilt teams that are in near desperate positions and at that point maybe they can extract the best deal for dylan cease a better deal than they can extract right now do i believe that the White Sox are going to hold him until the deadline? No, it's too risky. He can get hurt. He cannot pitch well. He can diminish his value some way. But you look at the market, again, the Yankees, the Red Sox, the Giants, the Orioles, the Cubs, all need starting pitching. And I can name other clubs as well. But those are five pretty prominent teams that are all in need. I would throw the Rangers in there. And again, if I sat here and really thought about it, I can keep going. I've just named more teams then there are starting pitchers available. And some of those teams, frankly, would benefit from the additions of two starting pitchers. So that is the White Sox mindset, in my opinion. And we'll see if it bears the fruit that they want. But I expect they're going to do quite well for Dylan Cease. Ken, a uh, little more somber topic here. Uh, Wander Franco with the Rays. We've kind of hit on it a little bit. You wrote an article about why it might be difficult for him to get back in the U S if you haven't read it about because of the immigration laws and visa laws and what he has been accused of not saying he did it is probably is frowned upon most of the time when you start crossing borders. Um, we had Jim, I'm not going to say Bowden, Jim Bowden oh. on yesterday because, and he said, Trevor Bauer will never pitch again in the major leagues. Do you think that Wander Franco, and this is just your opinion from what you've read and what you learned that he, I'm not going to say ever again, but in 2024, because the Rays have lost glass now. They got rid of Ray Rayleigh. They got rid of Kittredge. They're making moves to kind of shed payroll. But will Wander Franco play in 2024? And will he ever play again? And does this give the Rays a chance to void that contract and get their money back? All right. There's a lot there, AJ, obviously. And to answer your first question, I don't believe he will play in 2024. And I'll tell you why. Major League Baseball has a joint – domestic abuse policy, domestic violence policy. And it covers this kind of thing, sexual abuse of a minor, as well as a number of other offenses. Even if Franco is found not guilty in the Dominican Republic, even if he is not charged, Major League Baseball has the right under this joint domestic violence agreement to suspend him. We saw that with Bauer. Bauer was never charged with anything, never convicted of anything, but he was suspended. It turned out for 190 plus games. So 
even if Franco gets through the legal part of this unscathed, which I can't predict will happen one way or the other, by the time that is done, who knows when that will be? We probably are months away from resolution. At that point, then Major League Baseball gets involved more, conducts its investigation because they really can't get going until the legal stuff is cleared. And then Major League Baseball will decide whether to suspend him or not. Now, maybe it's April by that time. Maybe it's May, June, July. I don't know. Maybe it's March. But I expect that he'll get a suspension of some kind, and I expect that ultimately 2024 is going to be in jeopardy. Now, the rest of the contract. As I wrote, if he is convicted of this kind of crime, sexual abuse of a minor, under immigration law, I talked to two immigration attorneys, that would constitute a felony of the kind that you can bar a player for. Actually, it would bar him automatically from the country. When you are convicted of that kind of crime, that is it. You're out. So he would not come back. He would not be able to come back. And at that point, the Rays would not need to void the contract. He would not be able to execute the contract, and they would not need to pay it. Now, if he is cleared or even if he somehow pleads to a lesser charge, if he is able to come back, right, then the question of the contract becomes more interesting. And we've seen over the years from Lamar Hoyt to Denny Nagel to Francisco Rodriguez, teams have tried to recoup guaranteed money from players who got arrested and did not succeed. Ultimately, there was either a settlement or they paid in full. There is not much precedent for voiding contracts, but at the same time, if Franco is suspended, if he doesn't play much in 2024, the Rays save that much, and the question then becomes what happens to the rest, and I don't know the answer to that. We're not there yet. We're not even close to that point yet where that becomes an actual conversation. And Ken, I mean, as you wrote in the story, you know, if he did not come back, right, that's when the money gets forfeited it would be $174 million of the 11 years, 182 guaranteed that he signed in November of 2021. I think sometimes people don't realize that when these contracts are signed by players like him, where I believe he was maybe a year-ish, if that, into his big league career, um, most of that money gets paid later on in the contract, right? right? So for the Rays, if this plays out that way, most of the contract it, it would be gone. That's right. And again, if he is convicted of what is known as an aggregated felony in immigration law, then he's not coming back to the United States, and then the contract is not getting paid out, period. But we'll have to see if that happens. And yes, as you said, Scott, the way these contracts are structured, for fans who might not know, when you sign a guy with basically no major league service, like Franco, at the time he signed his deal, they're paid basically in accordance with the structure that exists in baseball now. A certain amount for their zero to three years, maybe a little bit more than they would have gotten. A certain amount for their arbitration years, roughly comparable to what they would have gotten. And then free agent years are where they are the most expensive, where they get paid the most. It follows the same kind of tack in that respect. So yes, Franco is still owed 174 of the 182, and we'll see how this plays out for the Rays. It's not playing out well for them, at least in terms of a player that they invested in who is not going to be available to them, a guy who might have been a superstar in Major League Baseball, and now his entire career is in question. Ken, you're a professional. We're going to let you go. We know that you have some breaking news that you were looking at your phone because when you never <laughs> – you never look off the screen. So if you just break it now, you don't have to type anything up. You don't have to do any of that stuff. Actually, Eric, I was looking at the story I wrote today to make sure I got the phrasing right. Aggregate, aggravated felony. I didn't even get it right. I couldn't even say it. It's an <clears throat> aggravated felony under immigration law if he is convicted of abuse of a sexual of abuse of a minor, sexual abuse of a minor. So these are confusing terminologies, or at least new terminologies that I'm not familiar with necessarily. That's why I was looking at the screen. 
There you go. None of us went to law school, but um, we but, thought he had who Imanaga was signing with, and then he fooled us. He lied to us. Yeah, well, that would be. I, I can tell you, it'll be by Thursday. <laughs> so, hopefully, yes, it will. Yeah, Cold that take. would be nice. All right, Ken. Well, hopefully, we'll get some signings going when we talk to you next. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Ken Rosendahl, with us on FT and Fair Territory is out there for the world. Uh, all of this still obviously very much relevant and in play. Um, the show came out late Sunday night talking about the Boris Four. None of them are still signed. Um, much more in Ken's Hall of Fame ballot. He breaks down that Giants Mariners trade with Robbie Ray and Mitch Hanniger and Anthony DiScofani, Dude and Dork of the Week, and questions asked include. Mets question, there's a Red Sox question, there's a Twins question. So all of it's up there right now. YouTube, Apple, Spotify, if you're listening, whatever else. 